Hi, everybody. I'm Catlin Morgan, Education Manager for Institute on Aging. Welcome to another one of our trainings. IOA is an organization devoted to helping older and disabled adults remain independent for as long as possible through an assortment of home-based services, including our new service, Compania, a program designed to personally guide family caregivers through the unpredictable complexities of caring for a person with dementia. You can find out more about this program and all of our programs at www.ioaging.org. So it's September, and September is recognized in the U.S. as Healthy Aging Month. And this is a time which includes gaining knowledge about how to reduce chronic disease factors and caregiver burnout through nutrition awareness. So addressing that very topic today, we welcome Sandra Chavez, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist of the San Francisco Nutrition Clinic. You can find out more about their work at www sfnutritionclinic.com, and I'll put that in the chat feature. Sandra has been a consulting dietitian with SF Nutrition Clinic for the past two years, beginning her journey with the clinic as a student volunteer during college. She became a dietitian in 2018 as a second career because she realized how many people need help managing chronic disease. She believes that food is healing and that good nutrition is essential to a happy life. As a, as a consulting dietitian for San Francisco Nutrition Clinic, Sandra is one of their professionals available to assist clients with nutrition and health goals. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over right now to Sandra. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you, Catlin, and thank you for the lovely intro. Um, well, I was going to say good afternoon, everyone, but it sounds like it's also morning elsewhere and possibly other times of day. So good day to everybody. Thank you so much for being online with us and really taking the time to learn a little bit about the Mediterranean diet, how it can help you lead a healthful lifestyle. So like Catlin said, I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, I've been working with SF Nutrition Clinic for a number of years. And But before we get started, I do want to just say a quick thank you to the Institute on Aging for inviting our clinic to share this information with you. I really hope to provide you all with, with some nice bit of knowledge that you can take and implement into your daily life. So without further ado, let's get started. Just a quick disclaimer, this presentation is for educational purposes. It's not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Consult your doctor or healthcare provider if you are choosing to start a new diet or exercise regimen, and viewing this course does not constitute a client and provider relationship. All right, so let's, before we dive into the, the details of the eating pattern, let's talk about a few goals that we've set up for, for today. So. By the end of the presentation, you should be able to recall some of those main components of the Mediterranean diet, differentiate between controllable and uncontrollable risk factors of chronic disease, really identifying those benefits of a Mediterranean diet or Mediterranean style eating pattern, and illustrate how to create a balanced plate, which I will show you a photo and we can all kind of work through that one together and understand how to prevent caregiver burnout by utilizing these self-care strategies. And remember, taking care of ourselves through, whether it's the nutrition or meditation or what have you, is self-care. And it is it helps us care for others a little bit more. So before we dive in, let's look at what the standard American diet. So I apologize to our uh, out of country folks here. This is gonna be applying to us mostly, but you never know. So in the within the standard American diet, we do have kind of an, a mix of how we're eating. But overall, this chart that you're seeing here, it's really the dietary intakes compared to recommendations, because we are we do have recommended amounts of, of things for us in the US. Um, this chart is taken from the USDA's dietary guidelines for Americans. It's from the 2020 to 2025 version. This is published and updated every five years. And what we can kind of infer from the chart, and I'm sorry if this is a little bit small, so I, I will point out a few um, bullets on this one. But there's a lot of different segments here where we can see that we might be missing the mark as, as Americans. So the very first number here, or the line at the bottom, is total vegetable intake. And so the line in the middle of the chart here, that zero, is actually right about the, the target. So we want to make sure that people are, are kind of hitting the mark a little bit um, 
that's around the recommendation. So the dark blue or kind of greenish, that's what it looks like to me on the bottom. It's how we, people can improve that pattern by moving up towards that line. So for total vegetables, about 90% of the population is meeting below the recommended amounts of, of total vegetables. So that's kind of a big number if we're thinking about it. And you know, the US does have millions of people in it. So 90% of them not really hitting the mark in terms of total vegetables. Um, if we, I'm just gonna scooch us over a little bit further over. We do have a section here with the total grains. So grains are, are one thing that you're, is gonna, you're gonna see come up throughout the presentation because they are such a key part of the Mediterranean diet. Um, but total grain intake, we can see in this number here, we're just below 60%. And that feels like, okay, maybe we're, we're doing okay. But as we move down the breakdown here, for this is the first line here is for total grains. The second line is for whole grains. So if we hit whole grains, we're seeing that it looks probably closer to less than 5%. Oh, excuse me. Closer to less than 5% are actually meeting or exceeding the recommendation for whole grains. And well over 90%, almost 100, are not meeting the needs. If we move over one more, we've got the refined grains. So almost the almost balancing out the people who are not meeting our whole grain needs are actually exceeding the recommendation of refined grains. So we're getting a lot of these like white flowers, white pastas and things that don't really have a whole lot of color typically. And that's where our nutrition is coming from. So overall, we are kind of missing the mark where we might be sort of balancing out here is those nuts, seeds and soy products. And partly I can only uh, speculate here potentially because soy is in a lot of foods. We do use it for a lot of different items. So let's move on to some, some of these risk factors. So we, there are several risk factors for, for chronic disease. So some of these are controllable, some are not controllable. So examples of things that are not, that are really beyond our control in terms of, of risk factors for chronic disease are family history, genetics, age, gender, race, and excuse me, gender is actually more of um, sex assigned at birth and race. So these are things that we that are kind of beyond our control. We can't really change them. We can't change our genetics. Can't make myself younger. It's no matter how much we desire that. Controllable risk factors, things that we can kind of take charge and, and do to help improve our, our risk of chronic disease. So things like smoking, if you, if you do currently smoke, very strongly recommend quitting as, as quickly as possible. Blood pressure control. We can, we can actually control our blood pressure. There's a lot of things that affect it, but we can work through that. Our weight, there are things that we can do to help control that. And activity levels. A lot of us, especially now when in the current state where we're at home primarily, activity levels have really gone down quite a bit not a far walk to even, you know, step out to the restroom where some of us may be in the office. That was our, our quick get up and, and stretch kind of moment. We don't leave our house probably for lunch, which those of you in, in California, thank you for spending your lunch with me. Um, but there are a lot of different things that we can kind of start bringing into these, into our days, especially right now when we're at home or a lot of us are at home. So really it takes time for us to evaluate the risk factors for ourselves and make those changes if it is within our control to help prevent that chronic disease. So a couple of things that I really wanna emphasize with this is that if you do have some uncontrollable risk factors, it's really important to look at those controllable ones and do what you can to help bring that up, to help bring, that, bring those controllable risk factors into a, a place where they are not gonna impact your, your health negatively. So, one, one thing that is not on this slide, but I definitely want to want to check in with everybody about is stress. Stress is one of those kind of controllable and uncontrollable risk factors. So there's times that we can't control the stress that comes out into our lives. That's, that's normal. That's what part of being a human is. But we can control how we react and how we cope with that stress. And so the the way we manage that particular risk, risk factor can actually have a, a positive or negative effect on us in the long run. So a couple of diet-related um, preventable diseases 
sometimes these are called lifestyle diseases. That doesn't mean that only our lifestyle is impacting this. There are still some other risk factors that can play a role that we don't have control. So I did want to kind of go through this list really quick and then focus on one. So with there's heart disease, type two diabetes, atherosclerosis or other cardiovascular diseases, overweight and obesity and metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is just a combination of conditions that really significantly increase your risk of heart, heart attack, stroke and diabetes. So the conditions are, are typically high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high cholesterol and any like that central or abdominal obesity. So if you carry your weight around, around the tummy area, typically that's more linked with metabolic syndrome. The, the difference with, with metabolic syndrome from a lot of other conditions is that its symptoms are not typically expressed. They really don't have symptoms. A lot of us don't know when, if our blood pressure has gone high. Some folks are a little more sensitive and in tune with it. Some of us don't know when our blood pressure is, is on the higher end or our blood sugar, our high cholesterol. A lot of folks go through life living with, with high cholesterol, not really feeling it because it doesn't have a symptom until things get pretty bad or turn into one of these other diseases. So the one that I did want to just kind of focus on so that you can have a, a brief idea on this is type two diabetes. So diabetes is one of the it's a disease that it unfortunately is affecting quite a lot of folks. It is being diagnosed younger and younger and younger. Um, some of you might know that type two diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes. However, we are seeing younger and younger folks um, being diagnosed with this. But there are, like with any of the other conditions, there's factors that you can't fix and factors that you can improve. So if your activity level is currently low, improving that can help reduce those risk factors or really help to mitigate some of these factors that we can't control. So again, just wanna emphasize, if you have a family history of any of these diseases, it's really important to adopt changes to eating pattern and physical activity to reduce that controllable or that modifiable risk of that disease. So what can we do? First, and this all ties in, I promise, we wanna do, we want to reduce that saturated fat, especially those animal fats, really increase our fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, get active, choose the, some more plant-based proteins, especially for reducing those animal fats. We can supplement with some plant-based proteins, manage your stressors, and allow time for self-care. And this really ties into a lot of folks who are either here today or that you might be working with currently as caregivers. If they don't take time to take care of themselves, it's, it makes it even more difficult to care for others. So, and lastly, just really tying this into what we're talking about today, follow those healthy eating patterns, such as the Mediterranean diet. So I did wanna put this out there. Diet is not meant to be a four letter word like it has been. So people talk about, oh, the keto diet or paleo diet. Diet here is actually just referring to an eating pattern. And traditionally that's the definition of the word, but we really wanna call it a Mediterranean eating pattern. And just to kind of plug a little bit more on that Mediterranean diet, according to the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, they do review some uh, various diets. They actually stated that research supports the use of the Mediterranean diet as a healthy eating pattern for the prevention of cardiovascular diseases, increasing lifespan and healthy aging, which really brings it all home for us here when it is healthy aging month. So take action, let's get moving on there. So what is it now that we've talked about the risk factors and things that we might be able to do? What really is that, that Mediterranean diet? Who follows it? Why? It's the Mediterranean Sea has a lot of countries surrounding it. And this is typically the eating patterns that follow all of them. Now, remember, it's even though it, it is Mediterranean diet, it doesn't have an official diet. It's, it's really that eating pattern that we're kind of taking from different countries. Um, so not really specifically saying, oh, we're just gonna learn about Italian food or just Israeli food. No, we, we, we're kind of going from the region. There are some things that they do have in common. And typically they're, the countries typically have foods that are lower in processed foods. And this is more traditional. They're higher in fruits and vegetables, lots of whole grains, and really, proteins tend to be from the sea or from plants. So this is more of a, it's a combination of, of a lot of these things. Um, so I don't know if anybody kind of has looked up or had the, that 
new year's resolution of, I want, I want to change my diet or I want to do this. So U S news actually ranks diets every year and they go through and they rank it by how easy it is to follow, what, how affordable it is, how it impacts our, or your, your weight. So it's been several years in a row now that the Mediterranean diet has been ranked as number one. The where it doesn't quite rank as high as others is how fast weight loss is. And that's primarily on purpose because fast weight loss is not sustainable weight loss typically. So that is another bonus for that Mediterranean eating pattern. So a few more benefits of, of Mediterranean eating. We do reduce that risk of heart disease reducing that risk of obesity and other associated diseases. It's really high in antioxidants. If you notice our little heart of, of fruits here, they're really colorful. A lot of color in fruits and vegetables really indicate higher antioxidants and nutrients. There's also a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease. It's high in fiber. So folks dealing with any kind of bowel disorders, whether that's IBS or IBD. So or even things like diverticulosis, high fiber diets do help manage flares. So I did want to just kind of touch on fiber for a bit because it is really important for not just our gut health, but just overall. The recommendation in, in the US is to have a between 25 and 30 grams per day. However, in, within the standard American diet, that typically includes around 15 or fewer grams today. So we're missing the mark by about half if we're aiming for that higher end. And really, like I said, high fiber diets are, are really linked with those lower risks of IBS or IBD flares and diverticulosis. Um, to touch on Alzheimer's disease. So in the National Institutes of Health, they have a publication called Research Matters, and they kind of review a lot of uh, recent studies. So researchers found that in eating a Mediterranean eating pattern does slow some changes in the brain that may indicate early Alzheimer's disease. So the results are really pointing to the idea that a lifestyle change, including our, our nutrition, can help to reduce the, the risk of this type of age-related dementia. Um, and given the other benefits that, that come along with it, it's a really positive choice for improving health. The last line really quick, improved insulin sensitivity. So insulin sensitivity refers to how sensitive your body is to responding to insulin. So how sensitive your cells are. It's more desirable to have insulin sensitive cells to help process those blood sugars or the um, converting glucose or the carbohydrates that we eat into glucose that our body uses for energy. So you might hear insulin resistance the resistance is when we're not really quite using that insulin efficiently, typically leads to higher blood sugar. And that's where, that's one kind of step in that, in the direction of the development of type two diabetes. So cognitive benefits, there are things that about the, the med diet, then a med diet is just kind of a shorthand way of, of saying Mediterranean diet, because it is rather long. Um, so 2015 study did find that adherence to Mediterranean type eating pattern is associated with less brain atrophy among older, old, older adults. There was a second study that did actually use MRIs to kind of, to look through this. And so I, I did have one of their photos here. The arrows are a little bit difficult to see, but Med D plus is a person who followed the Mediterranean diet style eating and Med D minus is someone who did not. Um, both of these are, the, these gentlemen, I believe were 52 and 50. So the person who did follow the Mediterranean diet was about 52 and med minus was, was 50. Um, and we did see a difference in, in their brain atrophy actually. So if we look a little bit closely, there's, there's three arrows on here and they're pointing to the temporal hippocampal region. And so it's really showing this Dark, darkening. So that's kind of our, the, that little piece of atrophy there. Whereas the med plus, we're not actually seeing that same amount of atrophy. So it's one that it's coming out more and more and really reinforcing a lot of studies that Mediterranean style eating does bring quite a few benefits. Um, 
a lot of studies point out that the foods in, in the med diet are really rich in those nutrients that have protective effects on the brain against Alzheimer's disease. It's actually also been shown to help improve the hemoglobin A1C. So that, that is actually a reading that kind of tells us the last about three months of what your blood sugar is. So it's also been shown to help improve that those A1C numbers and in the people with type two diabetes. So that resulted in also stopping or slowing cognitive decline in those study participants. So we've gone through some of these benefits. We've gotten through some of those risk factors. I'm hoping we have a lot of people jazzed out there about moving forward and, and putting some of this into practice. So a couple of the key traits that make up the Mediterranean diet or the med diet, really high amounts of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and unsaturated fats. That's like big key is unsaturated. There's moderate amounts of lean proteins like chicken, eggs, fish, and seafood. A lot of proteins actually are coming from plants. So that's our beans, other legumes, lentils. There's limited amounts of red meat, saturated fat, and sweets. So yes, there is some red meat involved, but it's not as common as, as we tend to eat a little more regularly. A lot of us, not everybody. Um, and my favorite part of, of the whole Mediterranean diet pyramid, which we will see in the next slide, is that foundation is physical activity and having meals together. Really, in, and, and really reinforcing that having a meal with a family member or a loved one, or anybody that you care about, whether it's in person or currently, if, if we're not able to meet for dinner, I've had a lot of Zoom dinners with some folks, it's been really nice. That's part of what's really important about this, this eating pattern. So it's kind of, it's part of it is, is lifestyle too. So, and uh, just to, Reminder, when we did talk about unsaturated fats, I'm thinking things like olive oils or other vegetable oils. So let's look at that pyramid. This pyramid was actually created by um, a, a society called the Old Ways Preservation and Exchange Trust. And they did this in partnership with um, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. You might hear me reference them quite a bit because they do a lot of really great research on nutrition as well. And they have a lot of um, just fantastic information. But you know, starting from, from the bottom, you know, we've got that social, being physically active, making sure that we are getting some movement in our day, moving our way up, those fruits, vegetables, grains, although the, the pyramid does show kind of various grains, it just means really bringing in more of those whole grains. So a whole grain is that one, one that is pretty well intact, and I will talk about them a little more in detail in grains over there, but that big chunk of our pyramid has lots of fruits and vegetables. We do see olive oil in there. There's onions, potatoes, all that good stuff, because we, we can get quite a bit. So if someone tells you don't eat white vegetables, that's not true. White vegetables actually do have antioxidants. They do have some healthy, some starches that we need in our body, so they're okay. Moving up through the, through the pyramid, we do see that fish and seafood. That's kind of the more preferred animal protein. A little bit further, poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt. Really kind of a moderate selection there. Um, you can do anywhere from weekly to maybe a couple, one, one time a day or so. And at the very, very tippy top in the smallest amount is our meats and sweets. So we try to do those a lot less often. Um, they add a lot of not just unnecessary calories if we're trying to lose weight, but they're also typically things that, that can be a little bit harder on our, on our body to process. Um, one thing that is really unique about Mediterranean eating is that it does include wine. So wine is in moderation and it's typically red wine and we moderate it to about one, one to two glasses. So for gentlemen, it is one to two. For women, it is one. And drink water. That's kind of the all around in nutrition, it's kind of common throughout everything. Drink plenty of water, your body needs it. All right, so let's get into more specifics. So grains, what am I talking about here? So we have a lot of a variety of grains. We might be more accustomed to only seeing things like white rice or pastas, but really there's a, a whole wide world out there of grains that we, that we can definitely bring into our lives. Whole grains are ideal. They are best. So really aiming for at least half of your daily grains to be whole grains is a great place to, to reach for. If these are a new adventure, adventure for you, try mixing it into like a white grain and then slowly phase out the, the white rice or white pasta. They do have quite a bit of fiber. So that really helps with our gut and heart health. 
but they can cause a little bit of bloating if you're not quite used to having that much fiber in your life. So whole grains, things like oats, they actually have been known to reduce our blood lipids. So our cholesterol that in itself is helping to reduce one of those risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The prebiotic fibers that are in a lot of these can actually feed our gut bacteria. Everyone has bacteria in their gut. We're supposed to have it there. There's actually some thought that there is a connection with our gut bacteria and our mood and our brain. They also do, whole grains provide those B vitamins. Some of them actually do have some protein. So something like quinoa can bring you a little bit of extra protein too. Um, and there's a lot of varieties out there. Really get adventurous, try different, different ones, see what you like. You might find something that you like. Um, I, a few years ago, just discovered that barley is actually really tasty. So give it a, give it a shot. So every dietitian's favorite thing, fruits and vegetables. So really those fresh and frozen are your, are really the ideal options. If that's, uh, you know, out of reach, or if um, you have a client who maybe can't afford that, going for the canned or dried, they're acceptable. Just watching for that excess sodium or sugar. Um, for canned varieties, especially things like beans, um, choosing the low sodium option is great. You can also rinse those, those items to get a little more of that salt out of them too. Um, whole fruit instead of fruit juice to, to have, really want to get all that, the good stuff that, that fruit brings us. So if we are having, I'm going to compare like an, an orange, a whole orange versus a glass of orange juice. We, I always recommend people think about how many oranges did we need to squeeze to get the juice into that glass of orange juice? And would we eat all of those oranges? Generally, the answer is no, unless you really love oranges. But you're also missing out on all of this, the fiber and the real nutritious pieces of the oranges by just having the juice. So another thing that you can do is eat with the seasons. If you're a farmer's market shopper, that's a great place to go with, with the seasonal produce. It's usually at its most, most flavorful. If anyone has had cherries earlier in, in the summer, they were super sweet and just delicious. Now they're kind of mm, losing that flavor. Um, making vegetables really that the star of the meal. Remember lots of color, lots of variety. That's where you're getting maximum nutrients and choosing some fruits as dessert. And you can go, you know, a little extra on the, on the really sweet fruits to kind of beef up that dessert piece. This is all one step at a time, by the way. So just don't, don't feel like you have to jump right into everything. So fats, fats are part of our, the Mediterranean diet and Mediterranean eating. There are just a great variety of fats found in foods. So for example, something like um, like beef does have quite a bit of saturated fat and most saturated fats are about liquid or excuse me, solid at room temperature. That's one way to identify them. A lot of them come from animals. The one exception here is coconut oil. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there right now about coconut oil. I just want to point out that we still treat it as a saturated fat. It's still kind of affecting the way that our body is processing it. So I would not dive right into coconut oil, but we do have olive oil, which is the, that primary cooking oil in Mediterranean eating. Um, other places to get some of these unsaturated fats are things like avocados, olives, some fatty fish like our salmon. Um, nuts also provide these, these um, more healthy fats too. And Part of this is also choosing the oil that's appropriate for your cooking. So if you're cooking something at like a higher heat, an olive oil might not be really appropriate because it does smoke at a pretty low temperature. Grapeseed oil actually has a hot, much higher smoke point, so it can take the heat a little bit better. Um, there's also a variety of olive oils. There are some that you just typically don't want to cook. So like the really light, extra, extra virgin olive oils, we don't really cook those. You, those are finishing oils or things to make a salad dressing out of. Um, and the really, you know, maybe a little darker oils or maybe the olives were not quite as, as young anymore. Those are the ones that we want to use for cooking. And finally, reducing or eliminate those saturated fats. And I realized I did not say so, but PUFA and MUFA are our polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fatty acids. Um, real quick, without getting too deep into the chemistry, fats um, are kind of like shaped like this. So if up, down, up, down, up, down. A saturated fat has only those types of bonds. An unsaturated fat has this like kind of a flat piece of it and it's easy to break. So those, the saturated ones are a little more difficult for our body to, to break down. The 
unsaturated ones or those that have those little kind of kinks, those are easier to break, easier for our body to use. Proteins, this is one that comes up quite a bit when we're talking about swapping out of, of using meats primarily as, as our proteins. People start asking, where are you gonna get your protein? We can get it from legumes. So think, our, think about plants. It is actually very possible to get all of your protein needs from vegetables, nuts, seeds, and legumes. So you may, have, may or may not have heard something about combining rice with beans to create a complete protein. What that's referring to is that beans have certain amino acids, rice has another set of amino acids, and together they actually create the same amino acids that you would find in an animal product. So it's actually a complete protein. So our plants are in, are in green over here. In yellow or a little bit less, maybe a little, choose a little less of. We've got choosing those lean proteins like fish or uh, over other animal proteins. Fish and seafood is really ideal for, for Mediterranean eating. A Little bit less on the orange end, still not, not never, but sometimes. Eggs and poultry, especially without the skin, they're good sources of protein, but we're gonna still incorporate them modestly. And finally, red meat. So we're trying to keep these to a minimum. If, there, if it is like a processed meat, we really wanna limit that to no more than two times a month. Um, an added bonus of having seafood as part of your, your eating patterns is that you can actually choose from fish that, that have um, small bones like sardines or anchovies, and you can actually get a little more vitamin D and calcium in your, in your diet. Not that you will be lacking in these because dude, the diet does include quite a bit of this. The other piece that does kind of take the cake here with calcium and vitamin D, tying it all together here, is dairy. So typically it's consumed as like a cheese and yogurt. Low fat is, is a little more preferred, but they're not intended to take over the dish. So we don't wanna make like a big old bowl of pasta and enjoy that with a ton of cheese on top. We really want, want to have that whole grain pasta and lots of vegetables be the star of the show here. So cheese is kind of that flavor enhancer that brings a little bit of extra taste to our foods without taking over. So while it is included in the Mediterranean diet or the med diet, it is higher up in the pyramid. It's a little bit smaller. So it does certain cheeses do have a little more saturated fat. And if you're not portioning them correctly, it is pretty easy to overdo it. Um, I happen to love cheese myself. So we it is important to kind of pace ourselves here. Yogurt, that's another great item. It is bringing us some protein. Yogurt is actually a fermented food. So I mentioned gut bacteria back a little, a few slides back. That also has quite a few bacteria that are beneficial for our gut. So yogurt is a good breakfast or a snack item. You can start with a plain yogurt and bring in some of your own fruits. You can add a few nuts to give it a little extra protein and really get creative with it too. All right, those sweets and red meats. We really wanna limit these to one to two times a month or like on special occasions. That's a challenge at first, especially if you're used to having a lot of these items around and it takes time. I did wanna encourage everybody to try to reduce your sweets as much as possible um, and do so slowly. Your taste buds actually do turn over every, every about 10 to 21 days or so. So you start kind of getting a few new taste buds. That's how they adapt to newer flavors too. So we kind of start maybe losing out some of those that aren't tasting the super sweet anymore, bringing in some that are, are maybe a little more sensitive to the, to the sweet foods. So using meats as garnish or flavor enhancers to, to give that primary focus on those vegetables um, or things that, that do have like beans in them, making those the, the really flavorful but the primary proteins there. Save those sweets and sweets for special occasions and really choose fruits as much as possible as your go-to. Um, I did wanna say that if you are choosing, choosing fruits and maybe having fresh fruit around is a little bit not, maybe it's not feasible just because whatever reason, busy, don't eat it fast enough. It's okay to have some that are canned. Just look for those that are not canned in syrup. So those that are canned in their own juice and then drain out the juice just to make sure that you are still reducing the sugar, but you can still have a little bit of fruit. Frozen fruit and frozen vegetables are like my go-to. Those are fantastic um, I, things to keep around in your freezer. Easily grab them, thaw them out a little bit and enjoy a little snack. Um, so for, for our purposes, sweets is referring to those pastries, candies, sugar sweetened beverages. So if you're a soda drinker or a juice drinker, this is the time to start bringing those, those down a little bit. And just another thing to kind of touch on, on the, the red meat. If it's a, a lot to kind of go from daily to 
very rarely, start with one day. Meatless Monday. That's been one, a, a new thing that, that came up in the last maybe like couple of probably a decade or so. People are kind of tackling Meatless Monday as their one of their days to reduce their meat intake for whatever reason. But if you're choosing to follow Mediterranean eating, this is going to be one way to, to start moving in that direction. So how do we build that plate of ours? So a lot of folks, when we start talking about changing our, our nutrition or eating habits, we start asking ourselves, well, what can I eat? And here comes the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health once again with their healthy eating plate. Make, making half of your plate vegetables and fruit. Whole grains are the ideal choice here. We're using those healthy proteins or lean proteins. While their, their uh, healthy plate does emphasize a little bit more on like the fish poultry, beans and nuts are still in that top, top part of it. Um, keeping the limit on, on red meats and maybe some cheeses and really avoiding bacon. I know, I'm sorry. Bacon, some cold cuts or other processed meats. We really wanna keep those to a minimum. So I will say one thing that they, that they do know on this that I'm not 100% on board with is that uh, potatoes not counting as a vegetable. Potatoes actually do have quite a bit of potassium in them. And if you're eating the skin, you are getting the fiber out of it too. So maybe don't let it be your main vegetable, but it can still be part of it using those healthy cooking oils, lots of fruits, drink plenty of water. So you can do water, tea, decaf, tea and coffee also count towards your hydration. Limit those, those milk and dairy on their own um, or choose low fat and maybe juice keeping that to a very, a, a very small amount. So lifestyle, it's this whole thing, you might've heard other folks, especially when they're trying to update their diet a little bit, they might say, oh, it's not a life, it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle change. This truly is a lifestyle. There, it's involving quite a bit of, of changes in your routine, whether that is from, from your eating habits to physical activity to just making meals a little more social. So it is actually truly a lifestyle. So if you are incorporating more physical activity, be sure to check with your doctor to see what's appropriate, if, especially if you have history of injuries. Um, Incorporating the, those groups of friends, of family, what have you, whether it's from Zoom or in person, whatever is safe for you, that can help with, with a little more of that social engagement while, while you're having a meal. If weight loss is one of your goals, small techniques can, can help. It doesn't have to be a, a, a huge change. Just using smaller plates at mealtimes can help with, with managing the portion a little bit. Um, my favorite piece of all of this is actually eating mindfully. So no TV at mealtime. If we're eating mindfully, we are paying attention to the food that's in front of us. We are really taking care to enjoy every bite of that meal. Um, that's one, one piece that can kind of help us not just with the eating habits themselves, but it also can help us with just having a nice calm meal. So as part of, you know, Healthy Aging Month, a lot of folks here are either caregivers or taking care of somebody or um, are working with, with those who are, are taking care of others. So it's really just vitally important to take care of yourself as well. Um, so according to the National Institute of Health, they do have the National Institute on Aging, 15 million Americans provide unpaid care for an older adult. So that's in addition to other responsibilities. So caregivers are really taking on the task of managing important pieces of that person's life, whether it's medication management, taking them to appointments, or just their day-to-day -day care. There's, it's, a lot of responsibility that you are taking on for another person, but it's really important to take care of yourself. So some of these, these tips are actually adopted from the um, National Institute on Aging's uh, own suggestions, but really taking time for yourself to avoid that burnout. Take a moment, step away from, from the, whatever the situation might be and take a break. Recognize when you need help and really ask for it because it is absolutely okay to ask for help. It is absolutely encouraged. Don't neglect, don't neglect your own health. You are busy taking care of someone else, possibly their medical needs. So take care of your own as well. There are support groups out there that you can join, find others in, you know, have, who have common ground and really find a way to support each other. Keep up with your hobbies too. If you like painting, puzzles, you know, going for nature walks, what have you. Any of these things, it's important to keep those going for your own mental health as well. And 
can't go without having that Mediterranean diet plug in here, adopting that Mediterranean style eating pattern to promote your own healthy habits. Remember, we can't really quite take care of another person if we aren't caring for ourselves too. We can't leave ourselves behind. And breathe. So even if that's your, your moment of, for the, for the time or for this afternoon, take a moment, deep breaths. So there's a few things that you can do to kind of make this lifestyle part of your own. So really freshen up that routine a little bit. Take up cooking if you're not already doing so. Doesn't mean you have to cook every day. Doesn't mean you even have to cook every week. If you're not cooking on a regular basis, choose one, one week, one meal, pick one thing to start. So I'm a big fan of breaking things down into really small manageable goals. So if there's one thing that you know that you can do just once or twice this week, make that your goal and build on it, keep that going and then add a little bit of extra to that. Farmer's markets, if you already are going, fantastic. If not, you know, checking out the farmer's market, stock up on those fruits and vegetables and fish. You can freeze all these items. So if you wanna stock up now, use them later, great. Change your, your cooking oils to olive oils using that unsweetened yogurt, bringing in your own fruits to kind of liven up that flavor. If you are having snacks, which is, I, I'm a fan of snacks, so snacks are encouraged, have some fruit, nuts, or yogurt instead of chips or other kind of prepackaged goods. Um, and to really kind of take advantage of some, some of these uh, fruits and vegetables that are more nutrient powerhouses, like dark leafy greens, adding a little bit of lemon or olive oil can help. Um, for example, dark leafy greens, those that, that typically have iron, like um, spinach, if you add a little bit of lemon to them, you actually get a little more of that iron out of it. So a vitamin C food like lemon, so citrus, with a food that has iron can actually help you absorb a little bit more. Olive oil paired with something like carrots can actually help you absorb more of the vitamin A in there. So there's foods that kind of work together to help improve that the nutrition or get you more of those nutrients. Um, and as always, frozen vegetables are just fine. They're absolutely perfect to, to keep around in your freezer. Easy, to, easy way to save some money or just to have foods that are maybe out of season. So where can you start? Pick one meal of the day. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Pick one meal. Think about a change that you can make to that. So what, what part of this meal can I adopt or can I adjust to make it a little more beneficial or to bring me closer to a Mediterranean style like eating pattern? Can you choose a plant-based protein? Is this a meal where we can try some tofu if you're ready for an adventure in tofu? Or can I substitute it with a nice piece of fish rather than you know a piece of meat? How many colors of vegetables can you add to your meal? This is one of my favorite things. If you have kids, this is actually a really good opportunity to bring kids into the like meal prep process. Um, one of the things that I encourage is actually picking a day of the week, assigning it a color and have, having the kids pick out a color to put to use on of that vegetable in that day. Kind of gets them involved in the process and you know it can help you really not have to worry too much about getting them their, their veggies. Um, and really add, add a snack. If you're, if you're on the go, having some snacks around, keeping that fresh fruit handy so you can just grab in and eat nuts, veggies, or any combination. There's a really lovely farmer's box here. Um, that can be another way to, to kind of get going with, with incorporating this, the eating patterns into your day. All right. If you individually would like to work with a registered dietitian to manage a chronic disease or just improve your nutritional well-being, where San Francisco Nutrition Clinic can actually help you, like um, Katlyn said, please visit the sfnutritionclinic.com. You can also email us info at sfnutritionclinic.com. We do have nutrition presentations such as this one, events, counseling, and um, with individual registered dietitians. I'm not the only one, there are more of us. Um, but we've gotten to our question point. Thank you, Sandra. And I apologize for any background noise. There's work being done on my building today, as we talked about before. Oh, goodness. But the first question we have is, if my hypertension is genetic, what can I do besides prescription drugs? So with, with hypertension, yes, of course, there's that genetic component. It's bringing in overall changes. So whether that is adding oatmeal, which yes, it brings down cholesterol, but it can help with, with our hypertension because our, our, that high fiber, 
using a lot of stress relieving techniques because that naturally breathing patterns can actually affect our um our blood pressure as is so keeping keeping those breathing patterns handy bring in some meditation there i will say that there are a lot of um, conditions out there that are genetic that at some point we will have to consider medication that's not to say that that medication is negative it absolutely serves its purpose. But if you do the things on, on your end here with, with the controllable risk factor piece, so reducing that sodium, keeping lots of fresh fruits and vegetables and rich in antioxidants, whole grains, all of that can work together. So it can, if we take care of that controllable piece, the medication can kind of step in and, and help us with the rest of it if it's still needed. Great. Um, one person says, I'm curious if the SF Nutrition Clinic includes naturopathic physicians. I'm currently a doctorate student in naturopathic medicine. I think our impact as naturopathic physicians can greatly benefit today's direction of nutrition. Do you want to speak to that? Um, currently, we work, I know that um, our actually our primary office when we're in person is within a, a medical group. Um, while we are not specifically linked with them because we are a private pay practice, if you wish to send folks over to us or collaborate with us, we'd be happy to talk to you more about that. Great. Um, here's another question. Do, do you use continuous glucose monitoring, monitoring for DM2? So uh, the CGMs or continuous glucose monitors are first of all, fantastic. Um, you can, I believe you can provide access to us. I'm not a hundred percent certain. I, I don't believe we have any specific contract with anyone. Um, if you do have one, that's great. I think it's such an awesome tool. If you are going to work with us, if you're able to download that data and send it over to us first, that would be great. Um, unfortunately, I can't say one way or another, if we're, if we're currently linked up with any of, of the CGMs, but, um, Definitely, if you're able to provide us with the data before coming to us, fantastic. Great. We have two questions. I'm a big salmon fan myself, so I'm very interested in these answers. Um, number one, is it better to eat wild versus farm-raised salmon, or does it matter? And is packaged lox considered processed food? Hmm. Um, as far as lox, I'm not certain. I don't think so because it's typically just smoked. Um, so I would say that can, you can kind of bring it in in moderation. And just to add a note there, things that are that are smoked also bring their own kind of set of, of risk. Um, I believe it was the World Health Organization did de deem some of these items to be potential carcinogens. So just be mindful, you know, don't have it every day incorporate as part of your um, as part of your routine. As far as the farm ver versus wild, it really nutritionally it's not really all that different um there are a lot of other considerations from sustainability to environmental impacts so it's up to it's kind of up to you i will say i i like personally i subscribe to a, a delivery box called imperfect foods they actually have a contract with a norwegian farming operation that does farm salmon um it's probably one of the better tasting salmons that I've had. Um, and the reason why I personally like it as far as like sustain a sustainability standpoint is there are very strict rules there about where you're, um, how they treat the salmon or how it is farm raised. So a lot of it is, it, it depends. If you wanna go for that, you know, really rich flavors, you might wanna kind of invest in some of like that nice like whole foods type but if if you know budget's an issue it's just fine to grab grab a big old piece from from like costco or other grocery stores okay um the next question is about meat um what types of meat are considered red meat and is pork in that category yeah it's a good question so yes pork is is included in that one tends to be a little bit higher on on the the saturated fat piece um so that also includes beef lamb um, I'm trying to think any kind of like lamb or mutton, goat, all of that falls together. So if we're talking about maybe more lean meats, we're talking things that are like poultry. So ch chicken, turkey, quail, all these other, any other type of, of birds that you might eat without the skin. And we're talking about fish. So really any kind of fish that, that you prefer. There are some that are that are, and bring us a little bit more. So things like salmon and mackerel that are fatty fish, 
bring us some omega-3s. So those are going to be part of our, our nice, the, the fish that we incorporate as part of Mediterranean eating. Someone wants to know, is it whey that lowers high cholesterol? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time for me? Um, someone asked about whey, you know, W-H-E-Y, mm -hmm. and wonders if whey helps lower high cholesterol. The answer to that is I actually don't know. I know whey is, is an animal protein, um, but as far as its effects on cholesterol, I'm not 100% certain. If we're picking out foods for, for lowering cholesterol, I'd really direct you to those whole grains because they we, we have seen those make a positive effect on cholesterol. Okay. Is it okay to eat the same meals every day? For example, salmon, muesli, some people like to get into a routine. I think the having that kind of rep, almost repetition in those meals is a good way to maybe bring in some other habits. Um, I do encourage a lot of variety though, as much as you're able to. So if you can make a slight modification, so whether it's a change in the fruit or a change in the vegetable side that you have with, with your meal, just so that you get a good variety of nutrients. So yes, you know, if we can have a spinach salad every single day, but that doesn't mean we're getting a, we're getting a lot of out of it, but we're not getting a variety. So if we do have a nice variety, if one day we're having kale, the next day we're having spinach and the next day we're having romaine lettuce instead, but it's still that basic salad or piece of salmon or piece of fish, just increase, encouraging a variety there. I, that's, I would really push you in that direction there. Right. Which uh, fruits and vegetables are best to get organic and where do mushrooms fall in the Mediterranean diet? Mushrooms are awesome. Um, they are part of our, we do, even though they're a fungus, we're going to incorporate them into our vegetable category. Um, great, great source of vitamin D if you're, if you're really into those portobello mushrooms. Um, so yes, mushrooms into the vegetables, bring those guys in. Um, and I'm sorry, Catlin, would you repeat the first part of the question for me? I got very excited about mushrooms. <laughs> it was about which um, of the fruits and vegetables are best purchased organic. Gotcha. Um, organic is going to be really a personal preference. In the U.S., it can be a little bit difficult to get or an organic certification. So you might actually have something, especially if you go to farmer's markets that are not labeled organic, but they might actually be organic. So it's kind of, it's a difficult and expensive labeling process. That's, it's challenging for small farmers sometimes. Um, as far as foods that you, if you want to, you know, choose organic at like the grocery store, um, there is a list called the dirty dozen, and it's usually food, uh, vegetables that you eat the skin off of. And those are the, typically the ones that you wanted to kind of lean on the organic end, just because uh, they can get, um, they might have pesticides on the or residue on the, on their skin. So it's the dirty dozen list. I think it's the environmental working group. I'm not hundred percent certain. So I, I, Catlin, if you could jot that down for me, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Perfect. I just did. Um, you already addressed that pork is in that red meat category. So that's been answered. Another person asks, is it good to drink protein powder? Um, you know, where you're adding other kinds of liquids. And if so, do you have any recommendations around that? With protein powders, I mean, it's, your protein needs depend on age, body mass, physical activity level can make a big difference there too. Um, if you are using a protein powder, I, I really recommend going as natural as possible. There are actually some like peanut powders out there that do are, do have a good amount of protein, maybe not like some of these artificial ones, unfortunately. Um, there's not a specific brand that I recommend, but, um, try them out, see which ones work for you. There are some folks who are a little bit more sensitive to some of these proteins. Um, good benefit is that there's actually quite a lot of plant-based ones out there now. So they use like pea protein or brown rice protein. Um, so I would likely steer you towards maybe some more plant-based options, um, as they kind of fall a little bit closer into our, our Mediterranean eating style too. Right. What about your thoughts on tofu? Tofu is actually a really great source of protein. I know that there's a lot of kind of thoughts out there between, um, because it does contain something called phytoestrogens. It's not quite the same thing. Um, so tofu and other soy is actually a really good source of protein and it's pretty lean as well. Um, also, if you get tofu that is processed in calcium, you actually are getting some, some more calcium out of it. So I think it's a, it's a good 
thing to a um, good source of protein to incorporate into our diets, not to mention it's relatively inexpensive. So if budget is an issue, that's an, a, an easier, low cost way to get some more protein in, in the diet. And related to that, is tempeh better than tofu in your estimation? <laughs> Yeah, tempeh is great. Um, so tempeh is more of like a fermented, so it does kind of play more into that gut health also. Um, it's not one is better than the other. It's more of a flavor preference. Um, if you are eating tofu, don't fry it, um, but just, you know, saute it or eat it raw. Tempeh, I think it can be mixed in as a variety. I don't think that one is better than the other. What about collagen, um, bovine poultry types one and three uh, supplement? Are, is that good to take? Again, I think this is where it's going to depend on what what your your individual goals are um, and what you might need that extra protein for. Um, it is a it's still an animal protein, but it it does kind of it's it comes in a lot of unflavored varieties. So I will say that's that's one positive of it. Um, can't say one way or another. I think you know better or worse. Right. You know, this is more of a strategy question, and it's a big one. How would you change your eating habits if the household or environment you live in, the participants within that aren't willing to do so with you? Oh, I, I absolutely hear you there. Um, that, is, that can be one of like the biggest barriers to adopting generally like a healthy lifestyle. I would say approach it gently and understand that that the people in your household might not be in the same place as you are um maybe making it making a case for you know we want i want you to keep you around for a long time so i'm and i'm worried about your health and i would like to try this as a way to do that um and also starting starting really gently with them so whether that is let's just pick one vegetable to try it, we can go as slow as possible those baby steps and i i actually in some of my other classes remind folks is little tiny steps are what makes those bigger steps happen. So start with the tiniest of steps that, that you can think of for, for your family or your, your household members and go from there. So one little thing at a time, you might find that they like it. They might be resistant to it. We can try something different too. You know, speaking of uh, good gut health as we were, do you recommend probiotic supplements or any staples or foods for optimal gut health? So any really fermented foods. So if you're a fan of like things like sauerkraut or kimchi, um, yogurts, especially too, can kind of really help contribute to your gut, gut flora and give you some more nice, healthy gut bacteria. As far as probiotic supplements, I would only recommend those if you've recently gone through a course of antibiotics, which do tend to wipe out a lot of our healthy gut bacteria. So bring in some kind of high dose to bring those back in. Um, I don't recommend going further than maybe like two or three months at a time, just because then we run the risk of overrunning with only certain strains of gut bacteria. Just, we have thousands of different types of gut bacteria that kind of live throughout our whole gut. If we push out some of those healthy varieties with some of the, maybe the ones that come in those um, supplements, we kind of run the risk of creating this imbalance. Um, and that can come in many different forms, whether it's, you know, lots of GI issues or, just kind of creating an imbalance there. So yes, if you've had um, antibiotics or have gone through a really stressful period and then kind of pausing those and bringing in those nice probiotic foods. Okay, somebody has a question about bone broth and I think this might be the last question we can address, but she says it has a wretched taste. Do you have any thoughts about bone broth or? <laughs> You know, if it has a rested taste and you don't like it, don't do it. I, I never want to make anybody eat anything they don't like. Um, so bone broth, I think for some folks, it can kind of be rehydrating if they're feeling a little bit ill, um, especially if they've gone through some like stressful illness going, going on that can help. And sometimes it's easier tolerated. Um, it's, it's one of those preference things. So if we're reducing our animal proteins that I would include bones in there as well. So if you can do more on like the chicken side, just to kind of go easy on it, that would be great. If not, and you really like your, your bone broth, which it sounded like you didn't too much, but um, it, I would still use it a little bit sparingly just because of animal sources. Okay, actually I do have just a couple more questions. Um, sure. You mentioned the types of meat that are considered red meat are pork. Uh, could you repeat those again? Oh yeah, so we've got um, pork, beef, 
lamb, mutton, uh, goat. Oh my goodness. There's, it, it will also vary uh, depending on your, your region. I know some folks eat different ones. Right. And yeah. also, what type of bread do you recommend as a healthier alternative to white bread? Ooh, whole, whole grain bread. Looking at that, the nutrition label under fiber, we really are looking for anything from three grams or higher. Um, I am not promoting this brand at all, but I happen to love Dave's Killer Bread. They have one that's like five grams of fiber per slice. Tastes great. I like it. So trial and error, try out different brands that, that are of the high fiber variety and see if you like them and just kind of locate your, your favorite one from there. Great. And this truly will be the last question for non dairy milks. What would you recommend uh, like cashew, almond, oat, macadamia milks? Yeah. So um, it, it depends on your, your preference and kind of what you're using it for. Cause there are different kind of textures with them too. Um, oat milk is great. I think, um, Almond milk is another great one. If you like cashew milk as well, that's fine. Um, the one that I would just kind of assign a little bit of caution is something like coconut milk, just because of the saturated fat content. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for being with thank us. Thank you. Um, it has been a wonderful and enlightening experience. Um, we will be recording, or we have been recording this, and we will send this out to everybody when the recording has uh, been completed. And we will also send some information out, again, just a reminder about the San Francisco Nutrition Clinic and IOA. And Sandra, I want to thank you for being with us today. And if you like, you may go ahead and stop the recording now. Thank you.